Hello everyone, this is Dr. Seema Balian. Uh, today I will be talking about pressure area assessment. And um, also we will be discussing uh, as a part of the pressure area assessment, um, uh, a tool that we normally use to do the pressure area assessment. And the name of that tool is Braden's scale. So um, I hope uh, that once we have gone through this um, you know, presentation, that you will have a better idea about how to handle the pressure area assessment station and um, how to complete the Braden's uh, score um, and Braden scale. Yeah, so let's go. So a little bit about the uh, station before we embark on it. Uh, so uh, pressure area assessment is a silent station and you will be getting eight minutes to complete the station. You will be provided with a calculator, a ruler, um, and the scenario, um, and you will also have a scenario and a blank Braden's assessment tool or a Braden scale. You will need to complete the Braden's tool accurately and correctly calculating the risk score. And that will be based on the patient's scenario and the pressure damage identified. You will need to make sure that you document all of the findings accurately, clearly, and legibly. Now, as I have uh, been talking about the Braden scale and the Braden risk assessment chart, we need to understand that what exactly is Braden scale. Then we are going to go about how do we use it? What all are the things which are there in the Braden scale? Why do we use it? So we will try and answer all these queries as we go along in the presentation. So let's start with what is Braden scale? Braden scale is a clinical tool that you can use to assess risk of a patient developing a pressure ulcer. But this should be used along with your clinical judgment. As all of us are aware that um, pressure ulcers are a very common risk factor to anyone who is in the hospital for some time. And we have to constantly uh, make sure that an assessment is done so that the patient does not develop a pressure ulcer. So Braden scale is a tool that is going to be um, you will be using quite regularly. And that is something which is going to give you an idea that what is the risk of the patient of developing the pressure ulcer. Now, what is the aim and what is the use of the Braden scale? Now, the Braden scale is used to identify the people who are at risk of pressure ulcer development. It is also used to initiate, initiate preventative measures on time. Um, it is also a source of documentation because that is like an objective criteria, which is going to give us the patient's um, uh, journey and how it has been, uh, how the assessment has been done and um, what actions have been taken as per the uh, Braden score. Ideally, it should be completed within six hours of admission of the patient. It should be repeated as and when the clinical condition of the patient changes so that we are always on top of um, uh, assessing the patient um, with regards to uh, the risk of uh, developing a pressure ulcer. So we should do it quite uh, um, often so that um, we can prevent and take the preventative measures on time. Now the benefits of using the Braden scale. A Braden scale is recommended by NICE. Um, and Braden scale is the tool which is validated and uh, it is the most validating and reliable risk assessment tool for pressure ulcer development. It is also the most commonly used tool in primary care and hence now it is recommended to be used in the secondary and tertiary care as well to promote uniformity. Braden is more objective and less subjective and has been proven to be of high interrater uh, inter relatability and consistency of the patient's risk assessment. So that is the reason that it is quite useful as a tool to give a consistent um, risk assessment for pressure ulcer development. A little bit more about the Braden scales, a little bit of a background that where did this Braden scale came from. So this was developed in 1984 by Braden and Bergstrom. It is mainly made up of six subscale. And these subscales are the things which we normally would be using to make sure that whether the patient is having um, uh, um, 
whether what are the risk factors which the patient is having in order for them to develop a pressure ulcer. Now the six subscales which are there are sensory perception, nutrition, friction and shear, mobility, moisture, and activity. Each of these items are scored between one and four, depending upon the condition of the patient. Now, this is how a Braden scale will look like. So if you see in this scale, there is an area where you can uh, write down the patient's detail so that we know that for which patient is this um, uh, Braden's chart uh, have been scored for. And after that, it is telling us that what does a score means. So it is, there is a key which is given that if the score is, uh, um, which can, by, uh, by using the key, you can decide that whether the patient is at low risk, moderate risk, or a, at high risk of getting a pressure ulcer. Now, majority of the scales, they are saying that if, uh, the, as the number go higher, the risk goes higher. Majority of the uh, different, different tools that we use for various things, such as the pain assessment tool, the higher the score, the higher the pain. But in Braden scale, I think that I would like you to, uh, um, to notice that actually the higher the score is lower the risk. So please make sure that you do not confuse um, in that one. So if you look at the, as I had just discussed that there are six parameters which are there in order for us to check that what is the risk of the patient to develop a pressure ulcer. Now, all of these six parameters are further divided into four um, sub-parameters. And those four sub-parameters are um, having a different, different um, symptoms which the patient might be having. And according to the history and the signs and symptoms of the patient, you will be then scoring um, individually. Say, for example, if you are taking as sensory perception as the first one, now the sensory perception means that it is the ability of, uh, to respond meaningfully to the pressure related discomfort. So the patient, um, uh, we are over here, we are checking that the patient is having the ability to recognize that they are having some discomfort um, and which might lead to formation of pressure ulcer. So in this one, if we go um, in uh, the, the first sub parameter, which is the completely limited. So this is like the patient who is unresponsive who does not uh, show any inclination of um, in having any uh, sensory uh, problems um, or showing any signs of um, uh, uh, pressure related discomfort that they are uh, totally unresponsive about that. They do not moan, flinch or, um, or grasp to any of the painful stimuli because they are having a diminished level of consciousness or they are sedated or they have limited ability to feel pain over most of the body surface. And hence, this increases the risk of uh, developing the pressure also because they are not able to communicate that whether they are having any discomfort or problems which might alarm you that there is a pressure ulcer um, being uh, developed. So it is very, very important that these patients are cared for very um, uh, um, uh, on an urgent basis and they are the, ob the observations are made regularly for these patients uh, in order to make sure that we do not let the pressure ulcer develop. So, so the first subparameter is completely limited. After that, it is very limited. Then it is slightly limited and uh, it is then comes the no impairment. So you can see that the lower the number the higher the, in, uh, the incapacity um, uh, of the patient and the higher the number, they are going towards more normal uh, behavior. So that is the reason that if you are getting a high score, that means that the patient is um, at a very low risk of developing the pressure also. But the lower the number, the limited capacity and hence the higher risk of developing pressure also. So the same way we are going to, um, um, going to be checking the rest of the things like moisture, in the moisture, the range goes from constantly moist to rarely moist. Activity, which is the degree of the physical activity. So that says that from the bed fast or confined to bed to walking frequently. Then comes the mobility, which is the ability to change and control your body position. So that goes again from completely immobile to no limitation. 
nutrition, which is an important part of this one. So from nutrition, it goes from very poor uh, nutrition intake to an excellent nutrition intake. And then comes the last one, which is friction and shear. In the friction and shear, you can see that it is uh, the first, uh, it starts from requires moderate to maximum assistance in moving to uh, number three, which is moves in bed um, and chair independently and has sufficient um, strength to lift up. So friction and chair is something that when you see that someone is able to move from bed to chair and vice versa. Um, and so that is basically the ability that we are checking over here. So according to the patient's history and according to the scenario that we have got, so the scenario is going to give you all the um, observations for these six parameters. So you will have to go very systematically through the scenario and notice uh, the what is the sensory perception of the patient, what is the moisture, the activity level, mobility level, nutrition and friction and shear. And as you go along, you will have to decide that what is the score that you are going to be giving. And once you have completed all of the six, then you are going to be adding up the score to come to a total score. So that total score is now going to tell you that what is the risk of the patient to, for development of the pressure ulcer. I hope all of you have understood this one. So now once we have got the total score, we need to now understand that what does that score mean? So you can see that if the score is 15 or more than 15, then they are at a low risk of developing the pressure ulcer. If it is between 13 to 14, it comes to the moderate risk. 12 or less than 12 is high risk. And below nine is severe risk of developing the pressure ulcers. So the, there are also, uh, uh, we have spoken about how the, uh, the Braden score is going to help us and uh, it is an important tool. But there are some limitation of the Braden scale as well. So the Braden scale does not consider pre-existing or previous pressure ulceration. So there is an out of these six things that we have just seen, there is no uh, parameter which is letting us um, uh, add any of the already um, present ulcer um, areas. So that is one of the limitation, but that we can obviously, uh, we can add um, as our observation and as our clinical judgment. So this is uh, something that we have just spoken and uh, at the beginning of the presentation that the Braden scale is to be used along with the clinical judgment. Now the things to remember, please remember it is a tool. So it, it should always be supported by clinical judgment as we have just said. Make sure that a risk assessment is fully documented along with a full skin inspection. Implementation of the interventions and document uh, all the interventions that you have done. Communication, ensure the degree of the risk is fully communicated with the patient and along with your colleagues as well, so that there can be a consistent care and uh, a realistic approach towards the management of the risk. The next we come to the criteria. Now there are four criteria for marking the station. And in the next few slides, we will be taking you through the criteria. So in this station, along with the Braden's uh, scale that you will be completing, you will also need to fill out a, a kind of a body chart, which is going to uh, tell you about what are the areas where you are more likely to get uh, the, the pressure ulcers. Now, these are the areas which are more prone. So out of, uh, there are around um, 10, 12 areas which are there. So out of these, um, and to be precise, there are actually 11 areas which are there, um, which, uh, and out of these 11, 12 areas, you will need to remember and you will need to write down at least eight for you to score full marks. Yeah, so these, out of these 12 areas, you can see that these are the areas which where you have less of the muscle mass and the body is, um, and those are the areas where actually your body weight or the pressure is um, transferred. And that's why they are at more risk of developing the pressure area. Now, if we go from top to bottom, then we can see that the back of your, back of your head, the temporal region or, um, of the skull, your ears, shoulders, spine, elbows, 
ischial tuberosity or buttocks, femoral trochanters or your hip bones, sacrum, your heels, ankles, and toes. So um, one way to remember all of this is that you can just start visualizing from top to bottom. And that is uh, in that way, you will be able to memorize at least eight areas to get full marks in this one. So this is one of the criteria to identify the areas where it is, uh, which are more prone to the pressure um, ulcers formation. Then in the criteria two, you have the signs that may indicate the pressure ulcer development. Now, this is also something that you will need to memorize so that by memory, you will need to write it down uh, because in the exam, you will be asked to write down um, the signs which are going to indicate the pressure ulcer development. And there are um, nine of the signs which are there. And out of that, you will need to know about seven to get full marks, or to achieve full marks in that one. So we, we can um, see that there is a pressure area, um, a pressure ulcer, a picture of a pressure ulcer over here. In the exam, you're not going to get a picture, but you will have to just um, uh, think about it and you will have to write down the seven uh, signs which you think indicates the formation of the pressure area ulcer. Now, if we start looking at these signs, if we go from the very beginning, that normally, it is the first thing, um, the first sign which comes for the development of the pressure ulcer is uh, a persistent erythema. And with that, we mean that it is the redness which comes around that area. And that is then followed by a non-blanching hyperemia. So it is that redness then becomes permanent. Then you uh, there is a formation of a blister. There is a discoloration. So it, the area might look more red or bluish. On touch, you will, uh, you will feel that the area is very hot or localized heat, localized edema, localized hardening or induration. And then eventually it becomes purplish or bluish in the localized area. And then once the tissue over there, um, and the tissue necrosis happens over there, then the localized coolness of the tissues because it is the, the cell death that has occurred over there. So these are the various stages in which uh, pressure ulcer development goes through. So out of these stages, we need to uh, know all these stages and we need to um, recognize them early. And also for the exam purpose, we will need to memorize all of these so that we can at least write down seven um, signs uh, suggestive of a pressure area uh, development to secure full marks in this one. Okay. Then we go to the third and the fourth criteria are the one where uh, you will need to complete the Braden's chart accurately and correctly according to the patient's scenario. And then you will have to document your findings accurately, clearly, and legibly. So if you see that in the pressure area assessment, um, you, there are three things that you will be required to do. You will require to complete a Braden score. You will require to write down um, at least eight areas which are more prone to getting pressure ulcer. And you will need to write down seven uh, signs which are suggestive of a pressure area formation. Now, uh, what are the red flags for that area? Failure to recognize damage or miscalculate the Braden score resulting in no action is the red flag. And uh, either of this will result in failure in this station. Uh, I just wanted to quickly, uh, this is not something which is going to be coming in the exam, but it is an important thing that you need to know that what is the stages of the ulcer. So the ulcer formation, there are four stages uh, where which um, you will come across in the formation of the ulcer. And depending upon the stage, uh, obviously it is the severity is um, uh, the higher the stage, the severe the pressure ulcer is. So stage one is the mild, uh, my, it is the mildest. There is only a discoloration of the upper layer of the skin, but the skin is intact. It might be a bit sore to touch and it might uh, have a non-blanching hyperemia and localized heat. Um, then um, at the stage two, you will start getting pain. There is a blister formation. There is a break in the skin and you will get an open shallow wound surrounding the area. And the area is sore, uh, red and swollen. Then in the third stage, you will have the broken top two layers of the skin. So in the picture, you can see that uh, as we progress, the, um, the ulcer is going deeper and deeper into the layers of the skin. 
So in the stage three, you will see the top two layers um, uh, of it is broken and you enter into the fatty tissue. The ulcer may resemble like a crater and then uh, you will start getting the bad smell which will indicate the tissue death as well as the um, infection. And on the fourth stage, which is the most serious stage, the, it is uh, the most extensive one. The sore extends below the subcutaneous fat into the muscle and the bone. And sometimes the bone and the muscles are exposed. There is a very high risk of infection and tissue death occurs over here. And this stage, it is extremely difficult to heal these pressure ulcers. So it is very, very important that we recognize the pressure ulcer formation in the uh, as early as possible so that the chances of us uh, dealing with it and uh, um, complete um, recovery are much, much more. So I just wanted to quickly take you through one of the example scenario that how you get the scenario and um, what kind of, uh, how can you calculate the score? Normally in the exam, the scenario that you get, in the scenario, they will be using the same term which are there in the Braden score. So it will be easy for you to calculate the score and to decide that which uh, of the sub-parameters are we mentioning. So if we see in this example, it is a lady called Brenda, 87 years old, admitted to the hospital after fall at home. Um, she was diagnosed with fracture neck of femur and is now confined to bed. She lives alone and very poorly kept. She's malnourished and dehydrated, and she rarely eats a complete meal. She makes occasional slight changes in her body. On thorough skin inspection, she was found to have moisture lesion on her buttocks and smelled of urine on admission. She was also difficult to wake and responded only to painful stimuli. She also is not able to make any movement in the bed and require maximum assistance to move. So, and then, so this is a scenario and we have to calculate what is a risk score. So if we look at the here risk score, I have just to be, um, give you a more clarity. I have highlighted the points which are there as a sub-parameter and what score are we going to give and which parameter are they uh, depicting? So if you look at the first line that she was diagnosed with, uh, with fracture neck of femur and now is confined to bed. So confined to bed is under the activity and it is the first, um, you will give it a score of one because that is um, in the activity, uh, um, this is um, the score uh, under which confined to bed comes in. Then uh, in the next one, she is malnourished and uh, dehydrated. She rarely eats a complete meal. So rarely eats a complete meal come in under nutrition. And the score that you will be giving for it is two. She makes occasional slight changes in her body, which comes in the mobility. But And the score that you are going to be giving is again two over here. And then there is a moisture lesion on her buttocks and smell of urine on admission. That means that she is having constantly been moist. So that comes under the moisture and you will be giving a score of one. And she is difficult to wake and responded only to painful stimuli, which tells about her sensory perception. And you are going to give a score of two over here. She is also not able to make any movement in the bed and requires maximum assistance for moving. So that comes under friction and shear, and you will be given a score of one. So now if we add all of these scores, that give us a total score of nine, which means that she is at a high risk or a severe risk of um, uh, pressure ulcer development. Okay, so I hope that this is going to give you some clarity of how the Braden score is uh, calculated. What does pressure area ulcer station require you to do? and um, what all are the various components of this station. And I hope that this presentation um, is uh, useful and that you have found this video useful and it is going to give you a better understanding of the scenario. So thank you very much for listening and good luck. Thank you.